When I was a student at Harvard uh, University, I had a friend who was a nun, and she took, convinced me to take this class in leadership from the Kennedy School of Government. Ronald Heifetz was the professor. There are 26 students from, tw or there are students from 26 different nations. Um, there were um, CEOs, a judge, a DA. There were ambassadors, the co-founder of a political action committee, co-founders of investment banks. There was a, like a state senator. It was, there was a general in the army. It was, it was an amazing group of people. And I definitely, um, the, the quality of the students definitely kept me on edge. Like I was definitely listening with all my powers. And that teacher, Ron Heifetz, you know, he changed who I am. He spoke with an uncanny and non-defensive frankness. He was an MD, so he um, was, had taught in the medical school at Harvard. Harvard. Uh, he'd also um, uh, done surgery. He was a surgeon, too. And so even though he was relatively young, he was 41 years old when I took his class, um, he just uh, impressed me so deeply. One of the things that I think was very powerful about him was that he was a cello virtuoso. So his um, student, he, he was a student of Gregor Piatigorsky. And so this uh, love of music and this incredible ability with music really infused everything that he did and taught too. So this week, I went through all my class notes uh, and I read everything um, from the doodles that spelled my wife's Hawaiian name in Greek letters uh, uh, you never know. You write something out on the top of a paper, uh, it might be there forever. Uh, to quotes with three stars in the margin. And here's an example of one of those. Quote, In disagreements, the first value we lose sight of is the ability to be curious. Anyway, the syllabus, looking back on it, says directly that the course's goal is, quote, to increase one's capacity to sustain the demands of leadership. It was perfect preparation for my entire rest of my life. And I remember on that first day, Heifetz said, if you are going through a difficult time in your personal life, he says, I tell you, do not take this class. Um, and he was right. The class was not an ordinary lecture, but a seemingly endlessly improvised discussion. I remember Heifetz would start by saying something like, what do we want to address today? And people would begin talking, and it felt strangely dangerous. Nothing was going to come easy to us. Nothing was going to be handled to, handed to us on a silver platter. We were talking about the feeling of the class in those days, and we all agreed that it was tense. Now, at one point in the early lectures, Heifetz just stopped being the authority figure for a while. He just sat back and sat with the class. And in the resulting chaos, we learned how much we all crave authority, how much we need guiding norms. It felt more like a Werner Erhard seminar than like a Harvard lecture. Now, Heifetz might not say this out loud in such an obvious way, but he regards leadership as above all a spiritual practice. Now the motivations for good leadership are spiritual. The character and the skills that we need to develop for leadership are also spiritual. To be effective, we have to recognize forces that were previously invisible to us and experience the world with intuition and based on a real understanding of ourselves. Leadership success requires curiosity, compassion, Wisdom, honesty, courage, humility, self-knowledge, and the right balance between detachment and passion. Now today it's Good Shepherd Sunday, and in the fourth gospel, Jesus faces accusers who are seeking to kill him. Like the, the tension of the moment is not conveyed in the short little part of the gospel that we read today. Um, at the end of Jesus' speech, they're basically looking up they're picking up stones to kill him. Now, Jesus uses the metaphor of the leader as a good shepherd. And when he does this, this idea was already ancient in his time. You see it in the books of Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and the Psalms. Now, you may be thinking to yourself as you sit there, no one listens to me since I retired. Or, I'm at the lowest level of my company. Or, I'm just a kid. I'm a chorister. What could leadership possibly have to do with me? 
Now, Heifetz makes a very important distinction between authority and leadership. So authority comes from one's institutional standing, and it involves managing people's expectations. Jesus was not the Roman governor. Jesus was not the high priest. He did not have this kind of authority. Leadership, on the other hand, means mobilizing resources to make progress on difficult problems. So leadership is getting things done practically on problems. And in many instances, people exercise much more powerful leadership without having formal authority than with it. And Jesus certainly is an example of this. Now make no mistake, Jesus expects each of us to act as leaders, regardless of our formal or informal authority. We exist to glorify God and to help solve problems that we encounter along the way. Now for homework, I invite you this week to consciously exercise leadership that is inspired by Jesus. I can't wait to hear what happened. You don't even know what's going to happen yet, but I'm looking forward to hearing about it. This morning, I'm going to do the opposite of what my teacher did. I'm not going to hide the ball and we're not going to do leadership exercises. I'm just going to say simply and directly what it was that he taught. And I'm going to begin with three observations about leadership. Now, one of Heifetz's primary ideas concerns the idea that there's a difference between a technical problem on the one hand and an adaptive challenge on the other. So a technical problem is one that we already know how to respond to. And if you will, there's already best practices for for solving that that issue. It may be um, something as simple as just repairing a broken bone, or it may be incredibly complicated, like putting a person on the moon. But an expert, a mechanic, a surgeon, a rocket scientist, already knows how to handle it. An adaptive challenge is very different, though. No adequate response has been developed for it. Now, I have in mind, as you probably do too, the most obvious adaptive challenge that we in our generation in this city face, and that is the problem that people have no housing in our city. They have nowhere to live. They're living on the streets in awful and desperate circumstances. But we also have other adaptive challenges before us. Racial prejudice, addiction, misinformation, poverty, war, election denial, despair, isolation, Now, it's tempting, very tempting for us to treat an adaptive challenge as if it were a technical problem and to look to an authority to solve that problem for us. Makes us very passive. But problems like this, adaptive challenges, they require cooperation among large groups of people and people who are seeking solutions, not just pretending to already know all the answers. So you may be sitting there and thinking, well, what was Jesus' adaptive challenge? And his disciples thought they knew all that along what his adaptive challenge. They thought that overthrowing the Roman Empire was Jesus' challenge. Or installing a new king who is a member of their same ethnic group. But neither of those were Jesus' adaptive challenge. Jesus is what Paul Tillich calls the new being. He inaugurated a new way of being human which we call the realm of God, the kingdom of God, in which all people would be healed, cared for, and treated with dignity. It is a realm of spiritual well-being in which we experience God as a kind of loving father, such as the father and the prodigal son story. This is what Jesus says and means when he says in today's gospel, the father knows me and I know the father. Now, as a spiritual community, Grace Cathedral shares this adaptive challenge of the kingdom of God, the realm of God. And in a society where Christianity is justifiably associated with misogyny, homophobia, and unkindness, we offer a vision of community in which anyone can belong before they believe. And on the basis of our conviction that every person without exception is beloved by God, We have taken on the adaptive challenge of transforming Christianity, of reimagining church with courage, joy, and wonder. Two, strategic principles. This is the shortest chapter in the sermon. 
Heifetz speaks a lot about the practical work that you will face when you are doing leadership. He describes this as creating a kind of holding container for people working on the problem and then paying attention to one's own feelings to understand the mind of the group. Leadership involves uncovering and articulating the group's adaptive challenge. So a leader also needs to manage the anxiety of the group. People have to be concerned enough to want to act, but not so afraid that they'll give up in hopelessness. Because human beings tend to avoid hard challenges, a leader needs to keep the group focused on the problem, not just trying to relieve the stress that is generated in the group as it's facing the challenge. And this involves giving the work back to the people at a rate that they can assimilate. Heifetz also points out that how important it is to protect leaders who do not have authority so that they can become part of the solution too. Three, the last section for my section on Ronald Heifetz. Heifetz taught us that the best leaders have such a deep feeling for their mission that if necessary, they will sacrifice themselves for that higher purpose. Now, Heifetz, when he first introduced this, it was a very controversial um, lecture. He called it getting assassinated. And we all thought, wow, that's, that's a really violent way of describing what happens. But it's what happens when the stress that a leader generates in order to solve a problem becomes so great that the leader gets expelled. That is the way I understand Jesus' life. It's the way that Jesus talked about his life too. In today's gospel, the Greek word kalos is the word good in good shepherd. And it doesn't mean good like in the sense of morally good, so much as like right, proper, genuine, authentic. Jesus is the authentic, the real shepherd. The real shepherd is not involved in a transactional relationship. The real shepherd isn't paid to care for the sheep. Instead, the real shepherd lays down his life. He has the power, the exousia in Greek, to lay down his life. And the word in Greek is his soul, his souksain, to lay down his soul for the sake of the sheep. And that's what a good leader does. Many leaders at some point have to decide whether to keep pushing for uncomfortable change, even when they know it will mean that they will be forced to leave. Now, before closing, I want to tell you a little bit about a leader that we experienced together in our history. And it's so long ago now that there's probably, well, there's probably someone here who knew him. But his name was Willard Gresham. And he was the first dean of Grace Cathedral. And he lived far away from California and moved to San Jose, California because his health was so bad that the gentle climate there was good for his health. And so when they invited him to come up to San Francisco to be the dean of the cathedral, um, he was... He, was, he hesitated. He was worried because the, the, the damp climate and the cold, um, he was worried that it might actually kill him. But he was totally wrong about that. Uh, so he came up here, and at the age of 39 in 1910, um, he, he began to address his two great adaptive challenges. The first was there was no building. There was nothing. There was just a cornerstone. So he was the one who began building this cathedral. And so in the section that almost all of us are sitting in um, were sections that he contributed to. And his second adaptive challenge was this. He saw so many people who were suffering, who were ill and needed healing. And so he began to form small groups of people and then connect the groups through written prayers that he would send to everyone. And he became kind of a national figure as a person who was a healer. And he also healed the people of the city. When people needed loans, when people needed help, he always gave of himself, all of himself, because he trusted God so deeply. Now, after serving at Grace Cathedral for 30 years, Dean Gresham retired. And a year later, his beloved wife, Emily, died. And many evenings, he would go and he would stand on the sidewalk in front of their old house. And he would just weep. He would weep with grief in missing her because he cared so much for her. And he found found in those days so much comfort from Jesus, so much comfort from the good shepherd, that he gave a stained glass window in the south transept. So it's the one right above Our Lady of Flowers. And I encourage you to go look at it. He gave it to us, to us future people here in the cathedral, so that we would know 
that like the sheep in that image who's being cradled in the arms of Jesus, we also are held by the love of God. At the end of our leadership course, Ron Heifetz reminded us how at the very beginning he had told us that he knew that he would disappoint us. <laughs> he talked about how at times the teaching staff too had felt that we were wandering in the desert, that some students might have felt hurt or misrepresented. But most of all, he taught us how to say goodbye. Heifetz promised that, when we, that we could shed light in our life even when there is no light around us. He said that the god of the Greek philosopher Archimedes was called the unmoved mover, but Heifetz said that he believed much more in Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel's idea of God. God as the moved most, as the most moved mover. My dear ones, we are called to lay down our lives for the sake of God's kingdom. But we are not left without comfort. We have each other. We have the people who came before us and we're preparing a way for the people who come after us. And we will always, always have the good shepherd. Jesus, Jesus teaches us that God will be moved by us, that God loves us. God loves us the way that a faithful teacher loves her students the way that a father treasures his lost child. 